you know how when you're watching a movie and like the main character has the same job or, as you or it's a field that you're very knowledgeable about and you just start spotting problems in it. Imagine an HVAC technician watching Die Hard and he's just like, no. Or, you know, a, a lawyer watching Law and Order. I am declaring an immediate mistrial. Or a doctor watching Grey's Anatomy. You listen to me now? Or a cop watching any of those shows where the cops are seen like interviewing people and investigating crime. Like, can you imagine? Well, Mr. Seinfeld, uh, we'll look into it and uh, we'll let you know if we, you know, if we find anything. You ever find anything? No. For me, though, because scientists are so overrepresented in all media and sci fi as, as a genre is dealing with what I do all day, every day, I don't think that it bothers me that much. Like, I just can't demand that every single movie. I watch or book I read be scientifically accurate because then it just wouldn't be very fun, would it? Just for an example, this conversation kind of comes up with this scene from Star Wars. Fast ship. You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon? Should I have? It's a ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. And people will just be like, well, a parsec is a unit of distance and he was referring to an amount of time and those units don't make sense. And I just, I don't know, this isn't even a good example because it's not wrong. Like in human conversation, all the time we use distance when we mean time, right? Like if you get a new apartment and someone says, oh, wow, great new apartment. How's the commute? How far is it to your work? Can you say it's only eight minutes? Like I asked how far distance and you said eight minutes time, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Like it's fine. And I know in the movie, he says distance when he means time, but he's also bragging about his ship. Like imagine there was a very famous race, like the Daytona 500, 500 miles. And you wanna brag about how fast your car did the Daytona 500. And you say, she did the Daytona in 475. That makes perfect sense. If we were having this conversation, I would tell you my real issue is that it doesn't make sense that he's using Parsec. A parsec as a distance is very specifically about the distance from the earth to the sun. And if I know one thing about Star Wars is that it takes place a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So Han Solo does not know about earth, right? What is that word? Is it a portmanteau for parallax of one second? So <laughs> we got to work backwards. What's parallax? Parallax is when you're looking at an object, imagine your finger, and when you change where the observer is, it looks like the object is moving, but really the observer is moving. So you can observe this when you look at your finger and you go like camera one, camera two. Like it looks like your finger is bouncing around, but really the object observing is bouncing around. That's parallax. So when we look at stars very far away, when we look from like fall, when the earth is over here, versus when we look from spring, when the earth is over here, it looks like they're bouncing around. If we draw the triangle, like I'm gesturing so much with my hands, but I'm just gonna put like a cartoon box showing you what I'm talking about. So if we have this triangle between a distant star, the sun and the earth, a parallax of one arc second means this degree is one angle. We know this distance, the distance from the earth to the sun is one AU, one astronomical unit. Is that what you're going with? We can we can do our trigonometry <laughs> and figure out what this distance is, right? This distance is one parsec. That's how you define a parsec. And the problem is, is that because Han Solo is a long, long time ago, far, far away, he doesn't know the Earth-Sun distance and he doesn't know what a parsec is. Of course, like maybe Star Wars is translated through something and his home planet, which actually, isn't it weird how nobody knows what Han Solo's home planet is? Isn't that so weird? Like, Star Wars could really use, like, some expansion on the lore. Like, I feel like we don't know enough about these, like, minor background characters. Like, how did he get the last name Solo? And why does he wear a vest? And how do we know Chewie's name if Chewie's never said a word in English? Like... 
these are questions I need answers to. Who cares about the Parsec and the Kessel Run? I can't enjoy this movie unless you tell me, like, but imagine we know Han Solo's home planet and they define Parsec the same way we do and that distance might be different, but it doesn't really matter, right? But still it doesn't make sense because in Star Wars, you talk to aliens, you talk to people from other planets. And so it doesn't make sense to use Parsec as a unit of distance when you would have to have a second piece of information, like what's a Hoth Parsec versus an Alderaan Parsec? And I've reached my limit of Star Wars planet names. Where is Jar Jar Binks from? Imagine you're a Martian, right? And an Earthling tells you, oh, this is what a Parsec is to this star. If a Martian measured that, they would be like, but that's not a parallax of one arc second. That angle's much bigger. And they would have to look at a star farther away to get a parallax of one arc second, right? So a parsec on Mars is a longer distance than a parsec on Earth. See? And that's my problem with this line. And it's not really a problem. Because, like, I wouldn't care. <laughs> I don't care. I wouldn't bring it up. You brought it up. Like, that's, it's fun to talk about parsecs, right? I love sci-fi. I love movies about science. I kind of put them into three buckets. I, I don't want to cinema sins movies, you know, like I don't care that much. I just want to enjoy a film, but I do enjoy them differently based on how they present scientific information. So my first bucket that I put sci-fi media into is like the nails it bucket, like sci-fi that's really interested in being correct and also telling a good story. My favorite example is Interstellar. You're, you're watching Interstellar and you can tell that they really cared about getting space flight right and like the equations on the board look really nice and you get to the black hole. Me and the audience, I'm like, oh, they had someone simulate that. That's really cool. Like you can tell, you can tell that effort was taken to make it look right. A second one in this category would be The Expanse. I haven't actually seen or read The Expanse. I like, I don't know if I should read it first or watch the show or if I should only read it or only watch the show. Let me know in the comments below without spoilers which order I should do it in or if it matters. Um, but I've heard the reason why I'm interested in it is that there are Earthlings on like a small planet, like a minor planet or an asteroid in the solar system and like they live and they're born there. And because the gravity is much lower when they come to Earth, like their bodies are kind of damaged. They can't move as well and like they die faster and stuff. And I think that's a really interesting application of like how we would be affected. What are the real life ramifications of being a species who travels the solar system? That's really interesting to me. And it's interesting to me to make it like a part of the story. And I don't know if I'm telling it right because I haven't read it, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like taking a science concept and making it into the story. That's really exciting and interesting. I'll scroll some examples of other stuff I put in this category, but one last one is Andy Weir. His books are always really good. He's, I think he worked at NASA as like an engineer. So like he, he wants to put science into his stories like realistically. And I remember when I read The Martian and I was reading reviews on Goodreads, a bunch of people were like, this book was fun. The story was fun, but like, I don't care about irrigation or the calories in potatoes. And I'm like, oh, I do care. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. That's what I wanna read about. I, w I want to read about someone actually sitting down to do the math and being like, how long can I grow potatoes on Mars? And what goes into that? That's very exciting to me. That's the kind of movie I wanna watch when I wanna watch like a really sciencey movie. The second category I put sci-fi media into is the, the doesn't care category. Like they're not out here to tell the most specific, accurate science story of all time. They are just using sci-fi as a backdrop to tell a fun story. And they might use small elements of physics and science and stuff, but that's not the point. The men in black universe. In the movie, men in black, aliens are on earth. Aliens travel to and from Earth. We can assume that Earthlings travel to and from Earth to go places to do things. Like what does the interstellar government look like? Why does this agency exist on Earth? Like we're essentially following 
the TSA in this universe. Like our main characters work at the airport. Have you noticed how in Men in Black, no one ever like goes to a different planet or like travels in a spaceship? Like surely all those things exist in that universe, but that's not what Men in Black is here to do. Telling us all the information about it, the first alien discovered and the first spaceship built on Earth would just bog down the story and make it boring and uninteresting. Sometimes you don't need to explain everything and that's what makes these movies good. Another example I really like is Jupiter Ascending. Like the story of Jupiter Ascending is just like capitalism is bad and in space. And I like that. I like to look at the giant sets. I like to look at the different types of aliens. I like to look at how they treat money. That's interesting. I would love to see a movie where we're just talking about economic policy in the intergalactic Senate for like hours and hours. That would be interesting. Why hasn't anyone done that yet? My last one in this category is the book Slaughterhouse-Five. Great story sci-fi elements but we we don't need it explained lots of things are happening and it's set in like a sci-fi universe we don't need all the details we're just having a fun story oh how does it work it doesn't matter how it works it's just happening i'm gonna scroll some other ones by again i don't think these movies are better or worse than the other ones it's just a different way to tell a story and i enjoy both equally the third category i'll still definitely watch them but they kind of fail at either one or both of these options. Um, an example is this movie, Lucy. I don't know if anyone saw it, but the the plot, humans only use 8% of their brains. What if they used all of their brains? A science idea that is so dumb on its face that I can't even enjoy the movie because I'm just like, who, who wrote this? Who thought Maureen Freeman, who I mean does give a lot of gravitas to saying humans only use 8% of their brains, but like it's so dumb that I can't even take any of this seriously. I spend the whole movie being like, it doesn't, it's 8% of our brains. How, why would we evolve? Like wouldn't it be an evolutionary advantage if you had a smaller brain in the event that we only used 8% of our brains? Because like then you would use less calories. So like if humans 40,000 years ago are on the brink of starvation, all the small brains would survive and they would have kids and our brains would get smaller over time because apparently they're useless because apparently we're only using 8%. It doesn't make any sense. Like it's so dumb that I can't even watch the movie. Um, a quick way to turn your movie into this is to have time travel because if you explain time travel too much in your movie, it kind of starts being like, okay, but then why are there any problems in this movie? Like any plot that is advanced by like, uh-oh, there's a problem. It's like, we'll just use time travel to fix it, right? I think of Back to the Future, which is a great movie, perfect movie, I mean. The time travel, they don't let you think it, about it too much, right? Because you're so worried that Marty McFly is gonna have to have sex with his mom that you don't even think about the time travel, right? Or Looper, I don't know if you, it, I watched Looper when it came out, but then I watched it again like two years ago. If you haven't watched it since, it's kind of good. <laughs> it's a fun movie. But there is a scene where Bruce Willis is talking to young Bruce Willis in a diner. You done all this already? That's me. I don't want to talk about time travel. Because if we start talking about it, then we're going to be here all day talking about it, making diagrams with straws. And he's practically looking at the camera. We have the plot to get to. So let's just get to the plot. And I think that's a perfect way. Yeah, it's time travel. It's working. We don't need to talk about it. It's fine. <sighs> I'm going to do it. Okay, people have talked about this for way longer and way better than me, but time travel did in fact ruin Harry Potter before... <coughs> so you have Space Hitler, but you also have time travel. Just go back. Just like, oh, you can't... You Oh, there are rules. Apparently you can't use it for big things. Okay, how about in year one of Harry Potter when... Space Hitler is on the back of somebody's head. Just kill that guy. Just go back and kill that guy after you learn that. Oh, you can't? You can't use it for even small things like that? What if, like, you're a little kid and you get bit by a werewolf and now you don't get to go to wizard school unless they build you a house and you can go there and werewolf out? Oh, no. You can't use it for that? You can't, like, undo a werewolf bite? Then what is it? Oh, it's only for children to take more classes? That's what the time travel is for. Oh, don't think about it too much because they all fell off a shelf. 
Oh, they just fell off a shelf and you don't know how to make another one, so you can't undo. Okay. Let's scroll some more movies that are like this, that are like in the not bad pile. What's another one? Oh, okay. In an attempt to be like an interstellar like success, um, a show or a book will create this really amazing world. And like, it's all this time spent world building and like, we know the language they speak and the clothes they wear and the history of the land and the peoples. And like, they spend so much time doing that, that it's just criminally boring. Everything else is just so boring. It's like, I really, I really read 700 pages and this is the story. I spent four hours in the theater. Like, yeah, it looks pretty, but I, I'm so bored. I'm bored. It's boring. You can't just throw a sci-fi painting and then be like, see, I did the thing. I made a beautiful story. It's not a story. It's, it's boring. Boring. Can you imagine if Lord of the Rings was just this and there was none of this. Like it was just this. That's what Avatar is. This. I realize I just spent a lot of time talking about how like, oh, it doesn't really bother me when movies get science wrong and then spending a lot of time complaining about movies when they get science wrong. But all of that was to say there is one thing that really takes me out of a movie. One thing where I'm watching and enjoying a nice sci-fi book and I'm just like, why? Why? And this video is about robots. I don't understand the way they make robots in media and I don't like it. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. All robot movies are bad. A robot is a mechanical thing that can do lots of complicated tasks in a row that you can program to do those things. If you think robots in real life, I mean, I always think about mechanical arms like in a factory, like an industrial robot, just picking a thing up, moving it over here, or like a laser etching robot or a surgical robot, um, or you can have them in your home, like a Roomba. But when you see robots in movies, they just look like this. I mean, what is this? Why would you? <sighs> I'm about to argue that robots in movies are bad from like the customer's perspective. What is this? Why would you ever want this? Really quickly, this is not a robot, right? This is a cyborg. Like Luke Skywalker gets a robotic arm. He does not become a robot. He has a robot attached to his body. Transformers. I mean, they're robots in disguise, but they're, they're not robots. They're aliens, right? They evolved to be robots somehow, but they're not robots, right? If your robot achieves AI, in my opinion, <laughs> it's no longer a robot, all right? It's a, it's, it's a human. It's a, it, well, it's not a human. It's like a person. It has personhood. If you have sensory intelligence, you're a person. AI doesn't exist in real life, though. That's in the movies, okay? Um, like the Iron Giant, he's, he's a gun, right? But he has feelings. So now he's got personhood. He's no longer a robot, in my opinion. Um, there are things that are human shaped, like Dorful and Discworld. And he's not really a robot. He's like a golem. He's like given like personhood. He, he's not a robot. These are robots, okay? Robots are like household items. They are purchased, they are used. Which brings me to a numbered list of our robots and why they're bad. Like eight months ago, the summer of 2022, just in case you're watching this at a different time, I saw this video <laughs> from Amazon and I, I just couldn't stop laughing. What a ridiculous thing. This is the always home cam. It's a robot. It's a robot camera for your house. Why was I laughing? it's gonna fly around your house, right? Which means it has to work on a battery power, which means it's not gonna be plugged in at all times, right? In order to fly, this has a motor spinning the little things, right? And there's like a fan and all that stuff. That's very expensive power-wise, right? So I was looking at this thing and they were advertising it as like, you have an app and you're driving your robot around your house. And I was like, this thing is gonna have a flight time of like 10 minutes. 
And if I'm allowed to drive it, I'm the customer, I'm an idiot, I am going to drive it for nine minutes and then be like, oh no, and try to get it back to like his little power dock and it's not going to make it. It's going to fall on the floor and break over and over again. But they changed the rules. Amazon did. So the actual product has a flight time of five minutes. So I wasn't far off. You can only do pre-designed flight paths. So like you will fly it around your house and it will ensure that it can do that in that time and get back to the little dock where it will charge for 90 minutes. Okay, when I first saw that video, I was like, unless the president of Amazon, an evil billionaire has kidnapped all of the battery scientists and engineers in the world and locked them in a cave for two years and they have designed a magnificent new battery that no one's ever heard of this thing is not going to fly for very long because batteries are not very good and i mean if anyone was going to kidnap a bunch of battery scientists it would be this evil billionaire here but that's not what happened it doesn't have a good battery it's just as crappy as i thought it would be right this is the problem with robots in the world batteries <laughs> batteries don't work very well Flying is very expensive for batteries. So this thing, well, I do give it points. Like, at least it's not human shaped. It's like an actual shape of an object that someone would actually use. I don't know who would use it. Like, what, it, what do you gain by having a flying camera in your house? Like, you could just have cameras in every room if that's what you want that plug into the wall and you could fling through them in an app and see what's happening. Like. The only thing I can think of is like if you have like a cat and you want to spy on your cat during the day, but like cats are smarter than a five minute robot, right? They could hide from that robot for five minutes. It doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. Like why you would want this. And also don't put this in your house. Like, you know, those ring cameras and the nest doorbells and everything. And like the police are like, hey, could we have the footage from that? And Amazon and Google are just like, oh, of course, here you go. And they don't even ask you. They just, of course, here you go, have it. Like, you put this in your house and you are like two years away from accidentally filming your 14-year-old granddaughter taking a birth control pill and then she's put to death by the state of Florida. So like, don't do that. Don't put this in your house. But at least it's, an, it's a shape, it's a size, it does a task that I would think a robot would do. This is what a real life robot is. So why are they like this in the movies? Like, what is this? Why would you ever want this? Like, the problem with robots in movies is that they are human-sized. What is the battery on this thing? So the battery was actually named by Benjamin Franklin. Uh, you know when you open a battery and you just see a bunch of, like, cells working together? Like, if you open a really big battery, it's just a bunch of smaller batteries inside. He called it a battery because in, like, the army, a battery is a group of people working together to, like, use a weapon together. And so it's a battery. That's, that's kind of neat. When you open up a car battery, like, you just see sheets. And then inside we get into the anodes and the cathodes. And they're basically just a little carbonized copper sheet here. And then underneath that is a uh, aluminum foil sheet. And it just kind of repeats this. And this just gets really heavy. It takes a really long time to charge. Like batteries are really good at delivering energy, but part of the problem is that storing it is very expensive, like weight wise and delivering it is very expensive to like the lifetime of the battery and recharging it takes forever. So when you have this robot, you need to tell me how the battery works. How does it work? This is sci-fi, like, so it's still the future. It doesn't matter, it's batteries are better. Like, fine, I still, I still wanna know. Like, that would be an interesting, like, you know how they, they talk about how people can travel really quickly in space. Like, and they make up like, oh, it's the anti-particle engine, like, someone do something like that for a battery how does the battery work like give me some exciting highlights of the future of engineering how does the battery work explain it to me i want i want this robot to work i mean i don't want these robots to work because like they're bad but so a Roomba, which is a robot that lives in our world can vacuum for two hours on a fully charged battery 
and then it needs to go back to its little dock and it needs to charge for two hours. And that's pretty solid, right? You only need two hours of vacuuming and then it can charge and like you could send it on three things a day and it would vacuum those things and it's fine. It's perfectly functional. Imagine, <laughs> imagine having a human sized robot. It's like the size of an adult man. It's 5'7", it's made of metal, so it weighs 300 pounds. And oh, by the way, you want it to do things, so you put like a car battery in it. So now it weighs, do you know how much electric car batteries weigh? Like a thousand pounds. So like, we don't, you don't need to have this robot walk 300 miles, but you do need it. Like if you tell your robot to do the laundry and make dinner and pick up the kids from the bus, it's gonna be walking all over your house all day. You're gonna to have to put 500 pounds of battery in it and it's gonna to have to charge for like 18 hours a day. Like, why would you ever want this? What could it possibly do? There is a robot that is like, no one actually bought it, but it's a thing that exists that works in a closet to do a load of laundry. Like it starts the laundry it takes the laundry out of the washer, puts it in the dryer, and then it takes it out of the dryer and folds it and puts it away. And it takes this robot, which is plugged in, by the way, it's not a battery robot, it takes it 12 hours to do a load of laundry, okay? <laughs> That's what the state of robots is. If you want a man-shaped robot in your house to cook dinner, it's gonna take it like eight hours. And it's gonna to actually take it 25 hours because in between its four hour tasks, it's gonna need to go charge for eight hours. Like it doesn't make sense. The technology isn't there. And so when I see these robots, I'm just like, okay, but if the sci-fi movie could mention what advances we've had in battery power, that would be really cool. Cause I don't know how this would work. Like it's so unfathomable that it takes me out of the movie, but on the list of things about robots. This is the least of my worries, right? Because like, okay, it's the future. We fix batteries. Batteries work now, it's fine. They don't explode. It's it's not a lithium ion situation, right? Activity they were gonna be performing. They were charging, monitoring the telemetry coming off that uh, battery. Everything was going fine. They left for lunch. So number two, the second thing that is wrong with these robots is, is that they're human shaped. You have your adult male robot in your home. He's five, seven, and there's been advancements in batteries. It's fine. He only weighs 300 pounds, only 300 pounds. This is a very impractical object to have in your home. And I'm going to say it's a safety issue. I was thinking about this robot stuff and I watched a video from a YouTuber who I really like and I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna clip it, I'm gonna use it to highlight how dangerous it is to have giant metal objects in your house. And I really like this YouTuber and I, I, I'm not trying to shame her in any way. It's just an illustrative example. Roll the clip. And then somehow move this wash machine over a good amount. Oh, I could have killed myself there. Oh my God, Jenna, you did almost die. You almost died. It's dangerous to have giant metal objects in your house. But imagine if it was moving. Imagine if this was a 300 pound robot that just walks around. Like what happens if your robot gets stuck on the stairs and it's battery dead and you have to move it to the charging pad? What happens then? Are you gonna carry it? Do you have to push it down the stairs? What happens when your teenage son is like, wouldn't it be funny if I push this robot over the railing and it just destroys your floor? People talk about robots in like care settings. So like if you work in an old folks home and you're delivering the medications, like a robot will take that task and will make it human shaped to scare the patients, I guess. But imagine you have to deliver four pills into the mouth of a dementia ridden 96 year old and she's terrified obviously because a giant mechanical man is trying to shove pills into her mouth like her movements are not going to be predictable a robot could hurt her right just just for fun 
for fun, let's let's do the math on pushing a washing machine in your home. So let's draw the washer and the dryer as two boxes. Um, the dryer is always on top, right? Because it's lighter and it doesn't move around as much as the washer does. So the dryer is, the average dryer is 55 kilograms. The average washer is 80 kilograms. Okay. And our hero applies a force to the bottom of the washer to move it to the left, right? So let's calculate the force required to knock the dryer off the washer. Fun, kinematics, right? First, a free body diagram of the forces on the dryer. So the dryer feels gravity and pushes down. The dryer is resting on the washer, so it is pushed up by the normal force. The normal force, it's like, you know, Newton's third law, there's equal and opposite reactions. When you push something onto an object, it doesn't go right through, right? That object pushes back. So when you push something on the ground, you get an equal and opposite normal force that holds it up, doesn't fall through the earth. That's the normal force. But our hero is not pushing on the dryer. When we push the washer that is under the dryer, the dryer will move. I'm gonna go get a demonstration. Hang on a second. <laughs> okay, when we push on the washer, the dryer moves, right? But we're not pushing on the dryer at all. The thing stopping dryer from flying off the washer is friction, right? We would have to push really hard. <laughs> that worked really well. Guys, I should be a teacher. We pushed really hard. The push was big enough to overcome the force of friction and the washer moved and the dryer fell off. Our case, we don't want it to fall this way onto the person sitting there, right? So on our free body diagram, the dryer feels gravity, it feels the normal force, and it also feels a frictional force keeping it attached to the dryer. We can calculate the acceleration on this object that would overcome the frictional force and cause it to topple over by using Newton's second law, which is the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Great. So in the y direction, there's no acceleration because this thing is not jumping. So we can ignore that. In the x direction, we can set the frictional force equal to the mass of the object, which is 55 kilograms times A, which is what we are solving for. The formula for the friction force is going to be mu with a little s for our coefficient of static friction. I'm not going to go too far into it. This, this is a ratio of the normal force to the frictional force and it can range between zero and one. So the friction on like a sheet of ice where you like flick a hockey puck across is very very low, right? It just moves very very far. Whereas like if you are flicking a soccer ball on a grassy field like there's more friction there right there's something preventing the ball from going it stops faster whereas seemingly the puck on ice would just go on for very far because friction is very low a dryer attached to a washer is going to have a pretty high coefficient of friction because you don't want those things moving i'm going to call it 0.8 and we take our coefficient of friction and it is multiplied by the normal force which is going to be the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity. From this, we can calculate the maximum acceleration that the dryer can feel before it topples and greatly injures our hero. We get the coefficient of static friction times the mass of the object times g, which is the acceleration due to gravity, and that will be equal to the mass of the object times our acceleration, which we're solving for a. So we can cancel the masses, which is interesting in itself, and we get 0.8 times 10 meters per second is equal to our acceleration. Now, we want to solve for the force of the kick. So instead of looking at just the dryer, we're going to look at this whole system. And we can use Newton's second law again, right? All of the forces on this system are going to be equal to the total mass of the system. So 55 plus 80 kilograms times the acceleration of our system. And we are using our maximum acceleration here, the maximum acceleration that the dryer can feel before it falls. For the force diagram, we have 
normal force and gravity, which again cancel out because this object is not jumping, it's not moving in the y direction, it's not accelerating that way, we can ignore it. In the x direction, we have this force from the kick plus the frictional force felt by the dryer plus the frictional force felt by the washer because Newton's third law equal and opposite reaction, so we cancel those. So the force of this kick is equal to the total mass of our object times the maximum acceleration that our object can experience before the dryer tumbles off. And when we do that math, 1,080 newtons, which is like, for any normal person, a useless uh, piece of information. So let's instead convert our newtons to pounds of force. In pounds of force, that's 243 pounds. So if our hero could apply 243 pounds of force to this object in a swift movement, the dryer would topple and that would be bad news. Can a random normal human leg press 243 pounds? Yeah, I mean, it's totally doable. We saw it happen. <laughs> it's dangerous to have objects giant metal objects moving around our home that are massive enough to hurt our bodies, but not massive enough that there's not a safety stop in place to prevent us from moving them, right? And I know this is just an example with like some fake numbers, but like you can see that it's realistic numbers. It's a realistic problem. If you have a giant mechanical man moving around your house, what happens when he falls on you? What happens when his directive is give this old woman the pills and she starts fighting it? How can it prevent? And that's when you get these three laws. But you can't, you can't. It's a bad idea. Think about how dangerous driving a giant car is. People die in cars all the time. What happens when your nanny robot runs out of power and drops your baby because the batteries don't exist? What happens when your nanny robot gets hit by lightning and is just stuck in your driveway? What do you do? Are you gonna call somebody with like a truck and like pull it away? Like it's it doesn't make any sense that anyone would ever want this in their home. Like, think about how annoying it is when your fridge is broken and you have to hire a company to come take it out. Are you going to do that every time your family has a robot issue? It's a mess. The expense would be outrageous. It's dangerous. It's expensive. They're hard to move. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you want a human shaped robot? The third reason why these robots are terrible and all robots in movies are terrible is that why would you want a human shaped robot like think of the utility i'm just gonna give you an example i'm a little nervous about how much i'm talking about star wars in this video this robot is a translator we actually all have translators that we put in our pockets right now well, why would you make a translator that is the size of a, an adult human? You, it, your cell phone is a translator. You could put an earpiece that would translate text in real time. So why would you haul this piece of crap around to translate? And he's also an etiquette robot, which is fine. But again, that's just a video. Like. I do imagine etiquette would be a really important field to have someone on your team knowledgeable about in the future, right? Because you're going to see lots of different cultures on each planet. You're going to lots of different planets. You need to understand etiquette. Like, oh, by the way, before you go visit these peoples, Darmok on the ocean. But that information can be given to you in a video, which you can hold on your cell phone, which is this size and not the size of an adult human. Like you're traveling in space, like the size of your cargo is gonna limit where you can go. So why would you haul this around? And honestly, from like a customer perspective, like you go to the robot depot and you're like, we're looking for something to translate and they show you this and you take it? Like it's, it's huge. <laughs> what are you doing with this? Why is it? walking around it's a translator 
you can just put a translator in your pocket. Think about the domestic robot that people design as like a human shaped robot. Like, and they're like, oh, it could answer the door for you and vacuum the floor for you and let the dog out. And it's just like, but you could have a doorbell camera that answers the door for you. And you could have a little Roomba that vacuums the floor and you could have an automatic door that dings and your dog runs out and then runs back in. Like if a human robot, no, a human shaped robot did all those tasks, like can, it would have to be in your house. It would have to be lumbering around. And the way capitalism works, you would have to pay $9.95 a month to have the vocal transmitter so that it could actually answer the door. And you'd have to buy an $1,800 attachment vacuum. And it would be worse than the Roomba because it's a human-shaped robot. So it would have to like bend under things to get under the coffee table and it would be a mess. Or you could just have a Roomba. Like it doesn't make sense. Like in the world of consumer products, why you would ever purchase this giant thing like it would be so much more expensive it would be so much less useful than having a hundred different robots to do a hundred different things why would you want this this is the worst thing that's ever existed it doesn't make any sense this is the worst robot it doesn't make sense i feel like i should mention before we get much further that i understand that this robot is not a robot right this robot is a character in a film. It is basically a person, right? Like you're not treating this as an actual robot. I understand that in media, when people tell stories about robots, they're not really about robots, right? They're about humanity. And they're about like, what is a human? And what is an emotion? And what makes a person a person? And in order to ask that question, you take a thing that's not a person, but looks like a person in robot movies. But like, I'm not a film critic. I don't understand stories that well. I'm just thinking about this from the perspective of someone who realizes robots will be part of our future and being like, is this the most imagination we have? Like, oh, it's just like, you know how you do the dishes. It's just a man that does the dishes for you. Number seven, thank you. It's so lazy. Like sci-fi is supposed to be imaginative and explorative. And it's just like, oh, so it's just a robot that looks like a human doing it the human way. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't match how the world will actually go. Like even this Amazon robot, like I hate it. At least it's not big enough to damage your home if it falls over, when it falls over, you know? As we move forward in this list, I think my concerns with robots get more serious. Like the battery thing is just like a problem with technology. Like we will fix it. We'll have better batteries in the future. It's fine. But the idea that, oh, we're in the future and we can make any robot we want because we have any batteries we want and they're all just human shaped robots. It's so lazy. But here's my fourth problem. I think with robots and it's this <sighs> why are they human shaped why do they sound like humans why would you give your toaster a personality let's bring this boy back how did we get into this mess we seem to be made to suffer this I get it I get it it's an etiquette robot it's a it's a translator robot why why does it talk like that no I don't think I can make it I'm done why does it have that personality? Someone, someone programmed that. Someone programmed that robot to be the most annoying thing in the universe. I, and I get it in, in the movie, it's for story purposes, but like, would you ever buy this? Would you go to the robot depot and they're like, oh, this is an annoying thing. And you're like, yeah, I don't wanna travel the galaxy with that. Why does he talk at all? When he's not in the business of translating, he should be silent. It's, it's a robot. Can you imagine if your technology talked to each other? Like if your Alexa was talking to your Bluetooth fridge, I don't put either of those things in my home, by the way, don't do that. But your Bluetooth fridge is just like, hey, Alexa, she's really been eating a lot of ice cream lately. She's been really sad. 
are humans like a sad piece of shit. And then they're just having that conversation. What if you had a household robot and you talk to it because you're a human, right? Humans talk to things. They, they anthropomorphize things. They want to see the human in things. You're telling it about your day or like maybe it's just sitting there listening to you about you fight with your husband or you yell at your kids because their grades are bad. And then you go to the grocery store with your robot. Why in all these movies are they just seen walking around with these human shaped Why would you ever like go to the store with a human shaped robot? What is it? Is it your grocery list? You could put that on a phone. You could say it's the future. Everything's delivered. Why would you bring your robot? You could send the robot. I mean, why would you go with your robot anywhere ever? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. But imagine you're at the grocery store because apparently that's what sci-fi people think women want to do in the future is they're at the grocery store with the robot and you see your friend Martha and you walk over and you're talking to Martha and you're chatting and then you look over and you see that Martha's robot is talking to your robot. Like, what are they talking about? Have you noticed that in Star Wars? Why would they talk to each other? But I'm sure it must be your fault. You watch your language. You, you don't need to communicate through speech if you're a robot. You can just share files and data. You, you don't, why, why are they? And you see them talking to each other and you're like, what are they talking about? Is my robot telling Martha's robot how my daughter failed her math test and my husband has been cheating on me for years? Like, like why would, why would they talk? Why do they have personalities? Why, why? It doesn't make sense. Like who would purchase this? Like. If you could choose a variety of personalities for your Alexa, would you do that? Would you choose the snarky one? The one that's kind of mean? <laughs> like, who is this for? Who wants this? I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed. Oh, God. Before we get to my fifth and final reason why robots are terrible in, in movies and media, it's because they're shaped like humans, I want to give you the exactly three reasons why anyone would ever, 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 ever shape a robot like a human. The first is that you want to trick people into thinking your robot is a human. Spoiler for every movie since 1970, which is not a nice thing to do, so we probably shouldn't allow people to do that. Second reason is kind of sad. When a family has like a really late term, like miscarriage and it was late. So like the nursery is set up and they did not expect to leave the hospital without a baby. You have a baby, but you don't have a child. You, you didn't, you didn't get to bring the baby home. And, like grieving that can be really horrible. And there is a thing some people do when they experience this is where they get a little doll made of the baby. And it's something that they can take home and be like, my baby was real. This was real. This is really sad. I don't mean to be so sad. And I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't know if that's a good thing to do, but people do it and there's a market for that. And I imagine in a hundred years, if we were able to make hyper realistic robots of people, like there's a Black Mirror episode about it, right? Like your husband dies and you replace him with a robot. I see like that, that's a thing someone would do. That is, that's the market for human shaped robot. But like, I don't know if that's a good idea. Maybe we shouldn't allow that. The third and final reason anyone would ever want a human shaped robot is for sex. Like what if in the future you could just bring a picture of your boyfriend who just dumped you to a robot maker and you just make a new one and you send your boyfriend who's a real human pictures of you just like cohabitating with your robot boyfriend and he's like this is creepy and weird and I don't like this and you're like too bad I'm a creepy person or you know you you want to get a robot made of a child Ew. No. No. I don't like it. We should never make robots shaped like humans. It's not a good idea. Nobody wants this. We don't want this. People might want this. <laughs> this is one of those times where I'm like, my opinion's the world's opinion, right? And like the comments will be like, no, here's a million reasons why I want a human shaped robot. 
But the last, the final, the fifth reason why all movie robots are bad and why we don't want them in our homes is that they're shaped like humans, right? Like, when you imagine a robot in the future, it is doing a task, like an industrial task, like picking up the molten metal and moving it to the thing, or it's doing a medical task, delivering pills, or doing surgery, or it is doing a domestic task, like mowing your lawn, picking up the thing from the store, right? Why would you want those things to look human? What does it say about a person if they are like, I don't want to do any domestic tasks in my home, but I would like the robot who does them to look like a human? Like, it's weird. Like, why, why would you want to look at a human doing the things that you don't like to do? Like, you want to watch a human-shaped robot clean your toilet instead of just having like a little insect-like thing that scrubs the bowl and then like hides? Like, why? Why? Do you, do you want to pick the clothes it wears? Do you want it to look like raggedy? You're gonna pick its skin color? Do you want to program it to be sad? What is my purpose? You pass butter. Like, do you want the personality on your domestic robot to be like, I wish I wasn't a robot. Like, it's weird. Like, why would you, why would you want that? It doesn't have to be a human. Like, do you get, do you, do you enjoy watching human suffering? Does it make you feel better about yourself that you're not the human who has to clean the toilet? Like, it's weird. It's weird. Why would you want that? I mean, I guess if you're like a billionaire who likes having your human slaves work your warehouse, you would want to have your, your house slaves work your house. But like, like what normal person is like, I want a robot in my home. <laughs> and, and I mentioned this before, but humans really anthropomorphize things. When you get like a cell phone, like you, you have your cell phone, you use it for three years, like it slowly gets slower, like the updates take up more storage space, you're running out of storage, it can't do the latest things, and you get a new one, right? And if you're anything like me, you're like, oh, but I liked this phone, and you set it in a little pile, of old phones and they just sit there. In the future, is every human gonna have a basement full of robot carcasses where they're like, oh, I liked Benji X017. If I had a human shaped robot in my home and she cleaned the toilet and I saw her, like we were just like hanging out, you know, I'm just eating my noodles and she's just standing on her charging pad and I see her make her way towards the bathroom, I would be like, oh, you don't have to do that. I, I can take it. You don't have to clean the toilet. It's fine. And I would never let my robot clean anything because I would feel bad. I would feel guilty. I would have to rent a two bedroom apartment so that my robot, who's not a sentient being, who's just a domestic robot, could have a, a bedroom because I would feel guilty making my non sentient washing machine like charge in front of me. My poor girl. How could you? How could you? How could a human have a robot that looks like a human in their home? and not just like stop treating it like a robot like you would never let it do the dishes am i the crazy one with feelings like i feel bad about dogs who have to sit in the house all day even though they love it and they sleep i would hire a robot daycare to come interact with my robot during the day because i felt bad it doesn't make sense that we would ever have human shaped robots it wouldn't work for us we would make them people right away. We're doing it now with the chat GPT. We're just like, I'm an engineer and I programmed this language learning program to trick people into thinking it's human. And then it's like, oh goodness, I think it's human. And like, no, it's not. It's never gonna be a human. It's a program, but we're dum-dums. We've known this since the fifties. You can program nearly anything to talk to us and we will treat it like a human and we will think it knows something and we'll be like I'm not so sure that's just a robot even though it's not right this doesn't make sense it will never work it's pure laziness to put these in your movies like this can you think of nothing better these will never exist stop it
So, are there any good robots? The top five robots, number five. This is the robot from Minority Report. The little spidery thing that crawls through the apartment building to scan pupils is like identification. This is really good. Like, can you imagine if this was a human-shaped robot it's just like lumbering around like, knock, knock, knock. Who's at this address? Let me scan your eyes with a device. Like, that's not how robots work. Stop making human-shaped robots. These robots are terrifying little spiders. They crawl on your face. You do this. There's the scene where the woman's like holding her child's face because he's like so afraid. I do worry that this is where robots are going. Like when you look at robotics, like the forefront of design and engineering right now, it's all like police dogs and army. I don't. I like this robot, but I hate it in real life. But it's probably of all the robots on this list, the one that would exist first. So. Yay. Number four, Wally and Eve from Wally. I probably would have ranked these higher, but like Wally as a movie is just so boring. I mean, like nobody talks for like the first hour. That was a joke. I actually made that joke in whenever that movie came out, like what, 2007? I don't know, I saw it with my high school boyfriend we were leaving the theater. He was like, did you like the movie? And I said, oh, it's a shame it was so boring. No one talked for the first hour. And he was like, oh my God, like you're, you're, you can't, you're no fun. Like you just don't like things. And I was like, I was just joking. Obviously it's a really good movie. I'm sorry. So look at me. I'm still no fun talking about robots. What, like 20 years later? It's fine. It's fine. The real reason Wally and Eve are low on this list is because I didn't, I didn't, I actually didn't understand the story. Let me tell you the story of Wally as I understand it, okay? We're on Earth, the humans have ruined everything like usual. They make these incinerator robots to travel around and gather the things in their little bellies like oh mom mom and to drive them up to an incinerator and then do it all again, right? They also give Wally's a personality. I mentioned I don't like personalities in robots, but I do think sometimes they can be useful, right? Like if you actually have a robot that gives pills to dementia patients, you want it to be funny and congenial and like nice and polite, right? In this case, they've given Wally's curiosity. You, you see Wally, he's driving around and he sees interesting things and he picks them up and he's like, this is interesting. And he takes it back to his house and he's like, this is in my interesting pile, right? So when he finds a plant, he's like, this is interesting. And he takes it back to his house and he puts it in the pile. Now, Eevees were also like, they're, they're built for the same purpose. They're paired to Wally's. So Wally finds the plant, Eevee comes to earth. She sees the Wally and she's like, I know that Wally's are programmed to find interesting things. Show me what you got. And Wally shows her what he got, <laughs> shows her what he got right? And she's not that interested because he doesn't show her the plant, right? But he's trying to, he's trying to keep her interested and finally she's the plant and then the plot of the movie happens, right? At the end of the movie, Wally's all broken because it's been 800 years and his pieces are all bad and Eve fixes him. Have I been calling her Evie? I feel like I do that. Eve fixes him and he's back and it's the same old curious little cat, Wally. And that is a 10 out of 10 movie. I like that movie. I like that the robots have really cool shapes that are specific to their tasks. I like that they use the element of programming a personality into a robot to like advance the plot. Like there's a reason Wally is the way he is. Except that's not what the movie is, right? The movie of Wally, according to the writers of Wally, is that Wally is different from other Wallys. Some sort of glitch caused him to have a curious personality, and that's why he collects stuff. And at the end of the movie, when Eve fixes Wally, he comes back, but he's not the same Wally because she fixed the glitch. And and then the power of love, and Wally comes back. Like that's an eight out of ten movie. <laughs> 
I just, I liked the idea of someone programming robots to have personalities for a reason. And when you make it just like a glitch, it's like, well, is Wally even a robot or does he have feelings? Because once you have feelings, you're a person. I don't know. Anyway, I like these robots. Number three. Number three is Hal from 2001. I like the idea that the robot doesn't have like a form. It's just a computer program that does tasks for the computer. I like the idea that he doesn't, in my opinion, in my viewing of the movie, but I've just shown that I don't really understand movies. In my viewing of the movie, he doesn't develop a personality. He doesn't become AI. He's just like, I have tasks. You're interfering with the tasks, but my mission is the task. And I kind of like that idea of like how robot logic could be a problem and like why a kill switch exists and also why you shouldn't have 300 pound mechanical objects in your home that can overpower you but the only thing stopping them from overpowering you is like a little button. You can see how that would be a problem. I like that he's squishy. Uh, the idea that you don't have to have like a hard robot. This is like a robot with a fan that's like got squishy arms. It makes perfect sense to me. Like let's move away from mechanical man robots. Like this is a healthcare robot. Like you don't want to scare the old people. You don't want to scare the kids. He's like a fluffy little guy. I like that his personality and his voice is very soft. But I also like that throughout the movie, he does not turn into a human. He does not, any emotion you put on that robot is purely you putting emotion on your robot because AI is not real and they don't have personalities unless we program them into it. And so I like that about this robot. He's just like, I have a task. I'm doing the task. I'm a squishy little guy. Perfect idea of a robot. Let's actually get squishy little robots. No, number one is Tars and Case <laughs> from Interstellar. I don't know if you can tell, but I like really liked Interstellar. I love these robots. I love the shape. I love the different way they move. Like there's that scene where they're carrying a human and running. There's that scene where they're like doing like the swirly design. I love that these robots were army war robots and they've been like converted to something else. Like it makes sense to me that you would assign a like robot that's gonna sit with like a battalion of people to have like a personality and a humor setting so like I really like how that's deployed in the movie as like oh it's telling jokes because like obviously in a very serious situation you might want to have a robot that's like chilling everyone out why are you whispering they can't hear you I love how he just uses it to watch tv because like I feel like that's how you would actually use a robot like these robots Oh my gosh, they're the most amazing robots that have ever existed. Whoever designed these should like actually design robots. I know that when they started working on these movies, these robots were going to be like mechanical army man robots. And I just, I think it would have taken out so much. These robots are the perfect movie robots. I love these robots. Why doesn't anybody like these robots? Have people, this movie came out like 10 years ago. Has anyone, we like these robots, right? Like best innovative like most interesting coolest design for robots that I've seen come out of a movie I mean Baymax is really good but like I love these robots these this is the robot well I don't want it in my house because it's too big but I would want a tiny version to cook in my kitchen and everything I love it I love every bit of it cool cool okay this is a robot video <laughs> I'm trying to take better videos. I got lighting. This isn't distracting at all, is it? This works. This is good. I'm a professional. How do how do people do this? I. It's fine. It's fine. It's good. It's good. <laughs>